I did have a mental note when I was thinking about the introduction of the Clarkson reference of double checking whether or not he'd been cancelled for anything first. <laughs> and as I was going through the intro, I was like, damn it, I forgot to check. So um, good to good to know that no one freaked out that he had done something that got he <laughs> shouldn't have been the reference. You're listening to the Offsite Podcast with Jason and Carlos, where we talk all things construction and technology. Join us for discussions with industry leaders and insights into the latest trends in construction. Welcome back to the pod. Uh, so I get a grief a lot, Carlos, uh, for saying in the start of every episode how excited I am to talk to the guest that is joining us. But today I am excited to, to speak to our guest. And I think I probably uh, might have said to you that I'm a little starstruck. So I came across, I guess, videos on LinkedIn like a year, maybe a year or two, maybe a year and a half ago. And like now for me, it's core content on uh, on LinkedIn. I like to think of him as the Jeremy Clarkson of construction equipment. So Peter Haddock uh, is a UK-based uh, equipment journalist. He reviews and makes contents about uh, content about like construction, plant, and equipment. And uh, and I'm a follower on on LinkedIn. So Peter, thanks for for joining us, mate. Thank you very much. Uh, lo- loving the Clarkson reference. Uh, only if I was <laughs> as popular as him, but you know, certainly trying to make uh, things a little more uh, entertaining. And apparently, I do edutainment, Jason. So you know, make uh, make people excited about the industry, which is fantastic to be in, and hopefully educate people at the same time with uh, sort of longer interview style videos, really, than people are used no, to. I- I think so. Yeah, you're, I'd say the the standout thing for those that haven't seen your videos is like your enthusiasm is infectious in the in the video. <laughs> so no, definitely keep keep it up. I fun fact, I did um I did have a mental note when I was thinking about the introduction of, of the Clarkson reference of double checking whether or not he'd been cancelled for anything first. <laughs> and as I was going through the intro, I was like, damn it, I forgot to check. So um, good to good to know that no one freaked out that he had done something that got <laughs> he shouldn't have been the reference. Uh, I guess maybe for a softball question to, to kick things off and and, and uh, start the conversation, Peter, I am interested, but instead of uh, plant equipment, is around your videos, scripted or unscripted? Oh, completely unscripted. So I go on to site. I've never met generally any of the people I'm talking to. So I'll have a quick chat with them um, and about what they're doing and the tech they're using and stuff like that. But um, I've got an engineering background, so an engineering degree, and I've spent about now 20 years in the sector, um, uh, previously doing sort of PR, strategic comms. So I've been immersed in this industry for a long, long time and fortunately um, listened a lot and gathered the knowledge of where things are going. So that allows me to ask you know, the the technical questions, but also the simple ones, which is like, how, you know, how does it work? You know, I mean, people get carried away with all of their acronyms. It's a 4575 five, version 234. Well, no, it's a camera system, you know, and it's yeah. like, let's find out how it works, you know. And I think that for me, having that technical brain just makes me want to deep dive into things, but try and explain them to people in, in human terms, you know, rather than it's cool tech and you should buy it. I don't think I think people have gone past that. They want to know why, you know, why is it different? And the one thing I don't do is is say buy this. You know, I, I, I just yep. enable people to talk about their products and explain them and then ask the questions that I think the outside world, you know, and your listeners want to know the answers to. Well, I think the other good news for listeners, anyone listening to this, is that for the first time in this uh, in this podcast, they're going to hear what an actual good interviewer sounds like. So um, that's a, that's, a, that's another bonus um, uh, with you joining us today, mate. Um, so maybe to start talking about something um, uh, more serious. So plant and technology. Uh, I think a lot of the people listening to this will be in construction, on infrastructure, uh, maybe some building projects. They're managing projects. They might be uh, scoping or delivering work with a lot of plant and equipment, but maybe not super in the detail of the technology on that equipment in the delivery of that work and how that is has changed and is changing and I guess will change for the stuff that you're seeing going going forward. So I guess I'd be super interested to maybe just with the idea of uh, maybe starting with earth moving, is there... 
is there any way you can summarize like where you think we are in the state of plant and technology with regards to, to say, earth moving equipment? Yeah, I think with earth moving equipment, we've seen lots and lots of changes. Now, is sort of in the European market, we've had legislation to get us up to stage five emissions. So we've done a lot of work on engines and stuff like that. Now we're going into electrification. And so that is coming through. There's lots and lots of different things that are happening. Quite a running in different contexts with the electrification. We're seeing a lot of things in generators, um, hybridizing lots of inputs. Uh, so generators with solar coming in, with you know charging up over the overnight and things like that. And I think we're really seeing this explosion in the way that we can use alternative fuels and or what we call drop-in fuels. So that's really changing the equipment itself. But the tech is now really, really exciting because the technology of how you operate the machines is really important. So new machines, we always sort of had people saying, oh, there's power mode, there's eco mode, there's all these different modes. Some of the manufacturers are going, well, hold on. Like, so I'd spoke to Caterpillar recently with a small wheel loader. They've done it all for the operator. So they've, they've taken all these things and said, we're going to make it auto. So if the people want power, it's right there. The engine and the product can give it. But while they're not using that power mode for the 5% of the pro, uh, of the time, we'll give them the eco mode, which will save them energy, um, save them, obviously, fuel. And I talk about energy a lot because sometimes it's electric, sometimes you know, it's mm -hmm. diesel. And so all of those on board, you know, from the factory solutions, those auto solutions, those helping solutions are there coming through because we have a real problem with operators in the UK. You know, we've got a huge gap where people sort of stopped their apprenticeships. And therefore, you know, we've mm -hmm. got 10 years, a decade or more of people that haven't been trained. And so young people coming through the PlayStation generation, as you call it, um, <laughs> they, uh, they basically, you know, oh, I wish I was the PlayStation generation. Exactly. They're training in a different way. And, um, you know, that's really important. And so they're more tech orientated. And so for me, you're seeing uh, this huge emergence of how you can find the information that your managers want by bringing data off all of the machines on their idle time, their fuel burn, their health, because they can wave at you and say, oh, I'm not feeling very well. You know, you need to look after me a bit better, get me a service. And all of that data comes in and there's OEM agnostic brands that I've worked with like Machine Max, which will collect that in from a JCB, a CAT, a John Deere or whatever, and, and put a dashboard together for that site manager to say, here's how the equipment's performing, you know? And if you've got a lot of people keeping the machine running, idling to keep warm in winter, that's using a huge amount of fuel. And um, that can yeah. lead to just simple training techniques that we've got in the UK, like eco operator training that the big players are like Flannery Plant Hire and Lynch Plant Hire. There are big plant hire companies here. They're rolling that out to be um, better on site for the whole project. But Peter, I'm super interested in the uh, the technology and the software and the sensors on on uh, equipment. And I guess. A, probably starting with a, a, a very basic and dumb question, but who's typically responsible for that technology? Is it like the vendor that, that makes the machine? Is it the owner that then has it across their fleet they might hire out? Is it the hirer that ends up, who really ends up putting different technology on the machine? Right. So you've got your standard onboard technology, which is running your equipment. Yeah. And so that is becoming more and more sophisticated. But I do a lot of work with Leica Geosystems. It's part of this, this sort of hexagon group. And they create 3D models, basically, are created to use their 3D machine control. So this is retrofitted has been in the past but you're getting people manufacturers like Hitachi and Liebherr coming out of the factory and there's more manufacturers that are going to be factory fit and Cat has also done that now their technology and those are sensors on the the uh, on the bucket the boom the stick and then you know that all feed data into the the sort of your brains uh, of, <coughs> of the machine and then you've got a tablet inside there the, the, where the tablet sits, that has all the calibration data of the machine. So the, this tablet itself, you, you can take it out, put it in another machine, because as soon as you plug it into the machine, 
it reads all the calibration data and says, you know, I'm a 20 ton excavator. Here's what, um, you know, my, my setup looks like. So I just saw um, literally last week on site people retrofitting uh, a Volvo um, excavator with this system. And basically that was through a dealer uh, with, with for, for like a geosystems called OnGrade. And there's lots of dealers around that can retrofit. But then you're getting things coming out of the factory that are like are ready. So you can use that or you can just use it as an excavator, and then when you're ready mm-hmm. for that 3D machine control, you can plug it in. Now, for your audience, really, 3D machine control, in my mind, is an absolute must because cost of material have gone up. So if you're digging a really big trench, it's not got to be a meter, uh, a meter deep. Let's make sure mm-hmm. it's exactly a meter deep. And so you can create a model and you can actually ensure that the excavator operator can't dig at 1.2 meters and then you've got all that expensive aggregate or concrete or whatever to go into the to the trench and so therefore you know you're saving money and you're saving time because what you do is you send the model to the machine fleet that's on site and they can have the complete site model from day one so if i'm really really fast and very efficient as an operator i'm not waiting around for the next part of my job. I'll just move to another part of the site, click where I am, and the model then allows me to to carry on working. And I think that's critical when you're talking about efficiency and getting things done. Um, We had a big project called the A14, major infrastructure road project that was delivered early and under budget Mm -hmm. that used that um, technology. And it's mandated now by National Highways, who looks after our big roads uh, and stuff. Yeah, but... You now got things that I'm following a road called the A417 with National Highways and, and a big tier one contract to Kia. They've created a 3D model of the whole site and the whole delivery of what needs to go where. And they've done digital rehearsals on how to deliver that with plant and equipment. So how to fleet match it, what technology you want, and therefore before anything goes on site everybody knows what they're doing the design and everything and so they've even gone to the extremes because of the where the where the rock um in in that particular part of the country is quite brittle and so they've got ground penetrating radar uh, on the back of a atv um all-terrain vehicle as such that is monitoring where any voids are you know, and they found voids and filled them up before the excavators go on site. So again, it's brilliant. They've got all of this above ground, underground, and things like that. Yeah, that's cool. I think like um, if if I think about uh, on most construction projects, uh, there's you know equipment's coming onto site all the time. We're either dry hiring it or wet hiring it, or it's coming through a subcontractor or whatever. Yeah. And so I guess yeah, the question I was thinking about when I was thinking about who's responsible for putting the technology on the machine that I get through a wet or a dry hire, someone's getting a mixed fleet. It's you know at some yeah, yeah. point nice. out there. Yeah. Whether hey. it's the hirer or the project or everyone. Yeah. And so uh, is is the solution that um, the the manufacturers or the technology makers are having kind of open standards of for data yes. transfer, or is it that people are retrofitting an, an, another system on top of the thing? No, no. What's happened is the industry sort of come together with, with that kind of information, you know? So typically in the UK, the plant hire company, because we're plant hire led in the UK, not contractor led where we're el- elsewhere in the world, the plant hirers will enable their machines to take the technology. And so, therefore, it's a plug-and-play situation. And if they don't enable their machines, they won't get on some of these projects, these higher-end projects anyway. So the plant hirer does that, but they tend to do it through a dealer um, or they'll now be buying in the equipment that's ready. So some of them will have their own internal teams where that look after that. Some of them will will work with, with like, a, like a geosystems dealers that will help them. And so those dealers might also provide them, like the site I just went to, they provide them with the the rovers that the surveyors go on site and do all of that work to help the model. Then they provide them with the machine control and the backup and support. And that what's really cool is if something somebody's not too sure about a model or something, those engineers can dial in to that exact machine 
and set set stuff up set stuff up for them and solve their problems. But the really cool thing that I saw last week was a rover kit that was put onto a truck, right? So I don't know if it was a big mm-hmm. Ford or, or something like that, where the operator, where the, the site manager can drive around and inside he's got a tablet which shows exactly what the excavator operator would see in the exact position he's at. So basically, he he was driving around and, and showing me the levels. So he said, we've got cut here, we've got fill here. This is what we need to do. I can see what's what's uh, what from not even getting out of, of, his, va- of his truck, which is just brilliant because it was raining and it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it was a reclamation site full of just, you know, it's just, you know, really really horrible um, site to trudge around in. Uh, I had to do that to take some pictures. But uh, but that gives everything he needs. And they even put on this technology where they were monitoring the payload of the excavator putting it into the ADT because they've got contaminated land. So they need to show where the contaminants are moving. So how much they've got, and that moved to a set area, which is, which is sort mm-hmm. of zoned off. And they're giving that data to the local council um, to say, here's how much we've got, here's exactly where it is, and here's how much it's going to cost to treat and and get rid of. And so yeah, all of that's in one system, the, the one Leica system, all linked together through their sort of Connex technology. Yeah, so that's the, sorry to Carlos to, to jump in over the top. That was the bit I'm really interested in. Like on the on the flip side, so yeah, I get the machine control bit, but the other side around sensors, load monitoring, and where it's gone, and 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 all that sort of stuff. The because we see a lot. Like I'm I'm obviously in Australia at the moment, and a lot of the projects here we see some form of that starting to really happen on most big earthworks projects. Yeah. Um, but it all seems to be through like an additional system sat like a, on top of the, you know, it's not, it's a, it's another third party system put on top. Usually it, I think it mixes between the contractor and the, and the hire. Yeah. So, yeah. So your, I guess the question I was interested to know is, is that kind of the state of play or is, is it starting to become more something that the hirers do? Yeah. When it comes to the level of where you're at. So, you know, I know a lot about Caterpillar machines. I've worked with them for for 20 years as a brand and they've got payload monitoring on, on board, you know? So they've got that technology on board. And so what you're doing is you're taking the, in the techie terms, you're taking the API feed, which is just a data feed from that piece of equipment into your management software. Like, like I mentioned, the sort of machine max system will we'll put that into a dashboard for you. So you've got some of those sensors for that kind of payload monitoring that are already now available um, from the manufacturers of new equipment. With the machine control, um, you've got the plug and play coming through now, but you've also retrofitted it. The critical thing, Jason, is the mixed fleet right? And when you come to mixed fleets, lots of things like Libes on, uh, you know, Volvo, JCB, but all on one project, what you need is a standardized way of doing things. And that's where you'll see these sensors being put on to individual machines to match all the information to make sure you're, you're standardizing what you're getting. And so, as things move forward, you know, and all the manufacturers have, say, payload monitoring, then you're basically going to pull that data in. But if you've got some that have and some that haven't, you're going to continue to sort of retrofit and add these sensors in at the moment. Yeah, so feed in. So you sort of end up with, so I guess to, to, to summarize, you're seeing that that hardware layer goes more and more towards the manufacturer. And then there's this software layer that ag- might aggregate between yeah. those manufacturers' data that, that yeah. that's something that a contractor or, or a hirer might purchase. Um, yeah. to, to, to run a mixed fleet. Yeah, so the lot like there, so the, the the way in which the fleet was working the last week was that Leica has got this um earth moving app as such that that monitors that payload and brings it into their own system. But equally what we've got is is a scenario where if you are looking at loads of different projects and loads of different um uh, situations, it's how do you take all of this information and put it in one space? And that kind of brings me on to safety because what's brilliant about you know technology like AI cameras nowadays, they can actually sense the human form 
walking towards a piece of equipment. We've even got a, a supplier that's that's changed that technology to to sense a truck coming towards the piece of equipment because that truck uh, needs to pass safely. So what we've actually seen recently, and again with Leica, is an X-Watch system that is integrated into their tablet. So instead of, I call it cab clutter, having sensors over here bleeping at you, having three or four different screens, the manufacturer one, the machine control one, the safety one, you know, and it's like, whoa, it looks like it's ridiculous because what we want to have is the operator looking out of their screen, sorry, out of their, not their screen, not on a screen, <laughs> out of their windscreen and at the job site because that's the safest thing they need to do. And so with the integration of the X-Watch system, which is a camera system all around the machine, into the tablet, that's one tablet and it removes everything else. And what they've been able to do as well with tech is 3D collision avoidance, which means like a bubble you'd put around the machine. So they're not allowed to dig below, say, a meter because the service is there. We've done all that model. Not allowed to go up. Um, above two, three or four meters or whatever because there's electric cables that might mm -hmm. be hanging down. Not allowed to slew to the left or to the right too much because you're doing a highways project and you can't therefore slew into the live traffic. All of these things enabled so the operator can automatically just look in front of them and do the job. You know, it's like you're describing the difference between like the the Tesla uh, driving a Tesla versus like the Uber I got last week, where he had like two phones, uh, yeah. a camera out the front, a camera yeah. out the back, <laughs> exactly. yeah. and then a little tablet over here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mentioned some like really practical and sensible um, technology there. Like um, you mentioned the power lines, uh, you, like how far you can dig, who's around you. Um, and all the way to the sort of 3D model aspect. So you're delivering scope at a quicker pace. Yep. How how standard or common is that now? Is that your HS2s, your A417s and your Transpennines, or is that pretty common now across industry? Um, I think you'll find it's becoming a, a project winner, let's say. So if you don't have the capability to deliver stuff properly like that, your competitors will. So when you're bidding for projects, you know, house building, for example, we're seeing loads and loads of use of tilt rotators controlled by the likes of the Leica Geosystems um, system that allows you to have a larger machine, less track movement because the tilt rotator is doing all the stuff, compact radius right next to the houses. So those people that are doing that, and I know a great guy called Richard is an owner operator. I've, I've you know, followed him for four years. He's on a little case. Then he's got a Lee Bear. Now he's got an even bigger Lee Bear coming. And he's knocking out housing plots so fast and getting paid yes. by the plot that he can invest in his business and grow his business. So if you're against someone like Richard, wow, you're in trouble. Because if you're using traditional methods, you've got people in front of you, there's there's more people plant interface, and um, you know, that is and can be dangerous in confined spaces, but you're putting more cost in. So he did all of that and he was an early adopter. The contractor he works for has now gone to machine control as well. Um, and therefore you're seeing them win more work uh, or or retain, you know, the clients because you know, they're being approached by the people. So it's all about how fast can you do it? How accurate can you do it? And we've mentioned earlier, the cost of materials has gone through the roof. So if you're saying to me, you've dug a plot and I'm, I'm having to put in extra concrete because it's not, you know, the right yeah. start, standard. But equally, we've had situations where houses have got have got to be made, uh, demolished because there's a problem with their build. So you can prove that you've gone that meter, two meters down, and therefore it's all there on the model as well, which the I've seen contractors and, and uh, developers sitting at the top of the field looking at the data uh, of the, at the bottom of the field where the operations are happening. So it, it gives confidence to everybody. And so I would say that if you, if you think, oh, it's not going to affect me, you're just wrong. Yeah, for sure. And I can imagine... Now that we have this data and we really can look at proper sort of productivity metrics, you can imagine some serious incentivization 
yep. from client to contractor or contractor to subcontractor. Uh, put my QS back on. Uh, QS yeah, back I was on. just waiting for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you can really do some serious incentivization against the most productive teams, gangs, subcontractors and contractors, uh, whether that's actually a monetary incentivization or just more work because you're highly productive. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Carlos, were you listening to a conversation I had a couple of weeks ago with Flannery Plant Hire, who were actually doing eco-operator training I mentioned earlier, and fundamentally they're trying to save fuel cost, et cetera, that you mentioned, and they were actually training Blackwell's um, senior operators, you know, experienced operators, on, on this process. And um, there's an incentive program. Uh, there's even hey. a, 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 char- a chart as such about improvements. So you can uh, every month you've got the first, second, and third placed operator on the job site getting some money, um, and also you know highlighting to everybody how they, when they invest in themselves and go on training and ask for extra support and training where they might have a new machine or new technology, <clears throat> they're actually going to be rewarded. And the great thing, Carlos, is this eco-operated training actually um, helps people to get work because if they move on to another project, this qualification is on their card now. So it's official. They've gone through the training. So not only does it help them get work, it also helps people save money, all comes together and and literally helps everybody uh, all the way through. But yes, I agree, incentivize people to do these things better and everybody makes money or saves money and becomes more profitable. Everyone wins. Yep. I have another topic I wanted to talk to you about, Peter, which is, is a a small tangent away and autonomy. Yep. I have uh, heard uh, people talk about it, about what, um, what construction projects are going to be like in the future. You know, it's like, it's always like the next five years or next 10 years. What are we? What are you practically seeing, and 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 where do you see it sort of going in terms of the extent to which uh, any plant equipment is is sort of autonomously running on on projects? Right. Let's start with the here and now, and I, I really think it's important that people concentrate on what is available now because you can make a difference now. So coming back to the machine control, there's now semi-autonomous function through the machine control systems themselves, which allow people to dig better and to do things better, right? So we have a semi-automatic solution right now uh, out there. Adopted. And it's not just Caterpillar that's got that sort of um, remote control station. Other manufacturers have now as well. So that's happening. We've also got the ability to put what I call a hat on top of a machine, um, which is an autonomous hat that we've seen from Moog Construction at Con Expo. I saw that. Basically, that takes a, a diesel-powered older machine in, in that case, which is a skid steer, and allows it to be autonomous and remotely controlled. So you can still have that remote control functionality, or you can have that sort of autonomy coming in. And I think this this relationship between remote control and autonomy allows people to say, okay, I'm comfortable with, with adopting it because I've got a remote control thing as a backup, perhaps. Um, mm-hmm. So that's how people are starting to get used to it. But I will be seeing in the next few, couple of months um, particularly in the show in June, uh, I'll be seeing a fully autonomous truck that is actually working in a job site in the UK that is basically you press a button and it uh, is a normal ADT. You press the button again and it's a fully autonomous ADT because I think what you've got to understand, and I think that's a really good solution, is what you've got to understand is some places will be able to use autonomy because it's it's clear of people, 
you know, <clears throat> there's not likely to be working on a on a job site that's got lots and lots of different movements about you know getting past other pieces of equipment in a linear sort of tight space. You know, quarrying or mining, we've seen autonomy um, doing really well. The thing about that scenario is when you push the button, you get back into the driver's seat. So that has, when you're a plant hire or when you're a user, it has all sorts of different applications. And, and I think that's the critical thing, saying how can you get the most out of a piece of equipment? If you can enable it and it's it works well, great. If you can disable it and just use it for other projects, then it's worth investing. You can't have a mm-hmm. big, big ADT sitting there going, well, I can't do any uh, other work at the moment because you know the autonomous bit hasn't been programmed into me because basically an autonomous machine is just a robot. You know, and so therefore, I think this hybridization of of how we we move to autonomy is going to be really exciting. And I think what it also allows, coming back to the safety piece, is we can have these solutions where it can be dangerous for people to go. You know, and we've seen a lot of autonomous robots and remote controlled robots doing things in sort of demolition applications and and mm-hmm. and things like that. And I can see you know, a fleet of little robots autonomously taking down a building, for example, um, quite soon, you know, and, and I think that's... Really- I think that gets the podcast uh, on some sort of watch list by saying that, but... Um- <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But, you know, and, and, and I think it, it is coming. It is all coming, but I, I genuinely think the the early adopters again are doing a, a lot of work and, and there's a development centre with National Highways it's looking at all these sort of things. It's looking at hydrogen, looking at drone technology and all the rest of it. Um, and I think we need to just use the technology we've got now and, and then, you know, prove that that works. And then that will help to accelerate the journey to from semi to full autonomy. Yeah, I think having worked for years on uh, remote and fly in, fly out sites where, where operators would be away from their family for four or five weeks at a time. Um, it would contribute to all sorts of depression, uh, marital issues, suicide. The remote control thing seems like a, you know, a, a no brainer. Um, yeah. So I that agree. would be, yeah, really, really, really exciting to see. Uh, I've just spotted the clock as well. So um, <laughs> I could have probably gone for another hour and a half, Peter, but uh, sure that was really could. interesting. Yeah. So for those that, uh, yeah, thank you for joining. And for those that are listening, definitely check Peter out on LinkedIn. That's a uh, number one recommendation for me. Uh, Peter's, uh, I think you're also on YouTube. Uh, yep. I think you have your own podcast as well. Uh, definitely check it out. It's, um, it's good videos. You'll learn a lot about uh, a plant. Peter, thank you very much for taking the time. Really appreciate it, mate. No problem, Jason and Carl. It's great to meet you um, over the waves and uh, keep doing what you're doing uh, because we need more people to understand how this industry can move forward. And there's certainly so many exciting things coming down and it's almost daily. There's new stuff coming into our sector that's going to make a big change in the future. So great to talk to you and great to be able to be on the podcast for your listeners to uh, have our chat beamed to them for whatever um, program they use to have their podcasts. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Peter.